Hi, everyone. Hey. Thank you for being patient in the waiting room. We're just sorting out some technical difficulties across the Atlantic Ocean, um, <laughs> which I think we've got sorted now. So I guess we'll just go ahead and get started. My name is Marion Starkey. I'm the Vice President for Communications here at Population Connection. I'm really excited about today's presentation. I have been following the work of OASIS for a really long time. Um, and actually, this is just a coincidence, but the upcoming issue of the um, Population Connection Quarterly Magazine, which will be out in June, is actually going to be about the challenges the Sahel region of Africa is facing. Um, demographic challenges, food security challenges, um, challenges with climate change, et cetera. And that is exactly what this group OASIS works on. So it's just this perfect timing. Um, so I am going to introduce our two speakers. They are both, um, well, they know each other from working together at OASIS, um, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization located in Berkeley, California. Um, OASIS stands for Organizing to Advance Solutions in the Sahel. So our first speaker is going to be Alicia Graves, who is the executive director of OASIS and the founder of the OASIS Initiative at UC Berkeley. Alicia lectures internationally on population and food security in the Sahel. She's a research fellow for Project Drawdown, analyzing the potential contribution of family planning for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. She previously worked to improve women's access to my so Prostol, which is one of the drugs used for medication abortion across seven countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. She completed her MPH in International Maternal and Child Health at Berkeley in 2006. And then our second speaker is, and I hope I pronounced her last name correctly, Lucy Wadrago. Um, she was an Oasis Sahel Leadership Program Fellow in 2017. Um, she's based in Burkina Faso, and she's a champion for reproductive health and rights in her community. She's been a midwife for over 15 years, working to provide quality family planning services in the Sahel. After serving as a reproductive health manager in a community in northern Burkina Faso, Lucy began working as the national coordinator of the NGO Sante Sud in 2017. And that same year, she was part of the Oasis Initiative Sahel Leadership Program, using her project management skills and exper experience managing health facilities facilities to further strengthen sexual and reproductive health programs in her community. So we're going to hear from each of these speakers and then at the end we'll make sure that we take time for a Q&A which I will moderate. I know we've got we've had a couple of questions submitted beforehand and if you have questions throughout the presentation um, please just put them in the chat box and we will be collecting those um, to pose to our speakers when the time comes. So Alicia please take it away. Thank you very much, Marian, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I don't think my screen is shared yet, is it? Good. Um, I just wanted to say before I begin, I really respect that Population Connection um, continues to make the links between population and the environment um, because we understand that by respecting girls and women's rights and helping to educate girls and making sure women have access to family planning, um, it can have profound impacts on the environment. So I appreciate that. And um, my work on Project Drawdown um, uh, has helped to demonstrate the effects that fa voluntary family planning can have on both um, mitigating carbon emissions and also um, helping, helping families in poorer parts of the world adapt to climate change. So with that, let me open, let me share my screen. Oops. Okay, wonderful. So um, this is the front cover of a research brief that we recently put out. It's available on our website. And um, I keep getting people coming into the waiting room. I think I'll do that. Um, this is called Fulcrum for the Future because we know that by investing in girls' education and voluntary family planning, we can really um, catalyze development in the region and promote security, which is an, a major issue in the region, as, um, as Lucy will speak to. So I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes, and then Lucy will speak for about 15 minutes, and then we plan to leave plenty of time for discussion because we know that that's the interesting part. Um, hmm. 
Here we go. So I always like to start with a, a global perspective and a historic perspective, because um, it's, it's really important that we realize throughout all of human history, uh, population has been stable, fairly stable, growing very, very slowly. And it wasn't until the last few hundred years when we saw improvements in, um, in medicine that people were living on to reproductive years and the population has grown super rapidly. Um, even in, in our, especially in our lifetimes. So the average American woman wants to have about two children. And so um, an average American woman and I myself, I'm in this group, um, will spend about five years trying to conceive pregnant or exclusive breastfeeding. So not at risk of an unintended pregnancy. And we'll spend about 30 years trying to separate having sex from getting pregnant and having children. And it's really important to keep in mind so that a large family is the default position for, for heterosexual couples. And I mentioned the importance of family planning for development. There's really good research. Um, this is from Ellen Starbird and colleagues um, linking voluntary family planning to all of the sustainable development goals. So, so I like to say that family planning is an investment, not a cost. And that's kind of a theme throughout the Fulcrum um, research brief. Um, Marion, thank you for the nice introduction. As she said, um, together with uh, Professor Malcolm Potts, um, we started the OASIS initiative at UC Berkeley way back in 2012. And in 2016, um, um, we moved it to a nonprofit organization. Uh, I actually took over Martha Campbell's organization, formerly called Venture Strategies for Health and Development, now called OASIS. Our mission is to advance education and choice for women and girls in the Sahel. And many of you will know where it is already, but I think it's interesting to know that it's Arabic for sure. And seen from space, you can see how the southern part of the Sahara Desert uh, is an ecological uh, transition zone where it turns into um, more green and, and verdant land. So, oh, uh, for those of you who haven't read the news today, <laughs> my colleague informed me, and this isn't funny, I don't, sorry for laughing. Uh, my colleague informed me that the president of Chad, um, Debbie, uh, was killed after um, going to battle with um, some forces um, from the north. So he, he died, it was announced today. Um, I mention it because I see Chad here on the map. And so, of course, it's an ecological zone, but, you know, um, due to colonialism, um, Africa has been divided up into different countries. And these are the countries through which the zone passes. Um, we include northern Nigeria in a lot of our work, and I'll have some pictures from Nigeria, from northern Nigeria. Um, it's predominantly Hausa, which is the, the largest ethnic group in West Africa. And this uh, map comes from a paper that colleagues and I had um, in Nature um, about two years back that's available on our website as well. The, the reason that uh, that the Sahel deserves our special attention is that it is um, unduly affected by climate change. And so the projections by middle of the century is a two to three degrees Celsius or about three and a half to five and a half degrees um, Fahrenheit increase in temperature. This is from the Niger air surface temperature, historical versus projected. And at the same time, um, it's a part of the world where women are um, some of like have some of the least power in their lives. And so this is a from a, a book by the World Bank um, called Voice and Agency, which I find very interesting. And sadly, Niger is the textbook example of lack of empowerment. So in Niger, only only 1% of women don't fall into one of these scenarios of lacking control over resources, condoning wife beating, um, or being married as a child. And we know that empowering women, especially through education and access to family planning, has all of these follow on effects for their family in terms of uh, family's health and economic well being. So, um, Niger has the highest fertility rate in the world. Um, on average, a woman will have 7.6 children. And 
that fact, coupled with the fact that child mortality has come down in, in, in recent years, means it's the fastest growing population in the world. So the population growth rate a few years ago was 3.9%. Um, that means it will double in about 20 years. And overall, the Sahel region, which I showed a, a map of earlier, is going to increase by about two and a half times by the middle of the century. Um, people talk about this as a paradox because child mortality has come down. So I just looked at the newest figure is it, it dropped from about um, um, more than more than two in 10 children around in the late 1990s were dying before the age of five. Um, and now it's less than one in 10, which is a, a great advancement for children's health and still unacceptably high. We would never, um, <laughs> that would, I mean, I forget what the US is, but um, it is, it is, like I said, unacceptably high. It is also contributing to population growth, but this is not the way that we want to see it slowed. We know it can be slowed in ways that are humane and, and respectful of girls and women's rights. And in fact, um, more women in the Sahel have an unmet need for family planning than there are current users. So this is for data from the demographic and most recent demographic and health surveys. And we can see it's about two to three times on average across these uh, Francophone Sahel countries, two to three times more women say they want to space by two years or stop having children, but are not using contraceptives, that's the red part of the bar, than there are women using contraceptives. And we know when family planning policies are, are, are good, voluntary, uh, respectful, and and really um, appropriate for the context, fertility can change super rapidly. And in fact, Iran, a conservative Muslim country is the country that has saw the fastest um, drop in fertility rate. I'm just checking the time. Okay, so um, there was a question about um, investing in education vis-a-vis -vis investing in family planning. So we talk about this in the research brief I mentioned, but um, it is important to know that this that in in countries where girls are married early and where women or girls enter um, childbearing in their adolescence, keeping girls in school is one of the most effective ways to delay that. And so this is from a paper by Judith Bruce and John Bongart at Population Council that showed that by increasing the age of marriage by five years, it could directly reduce by 15 to 20 percent the future population growth. And that's the best way to, to delay marriage. And this has been shown by my colleagues work in Northern Nigeria, um, Daniel Perlman and Habiba Muhammad have shown that keeping girls in school is the best alternative to early marriage and childbearing. Um, so I, you know, I think of education, I mean, my, my colleague Malcolm Potts would say it's, a, it's both a human right and a demographic imperative. And it works like demand generation. I mean, girls who go to school more than, like I said, more, more likely to marry later and start having children later. They have more decision-making power in the household. They have better access to health services and they're more likely to wanna to work outside of the home. So that's like a really um, virtuous circle of, um, of outcomes that, that um, can, can benefit the woman and her, and her future family. And I mentioned the work in Northern Nigeria. There's a lot about this on our website. And I'd also reference the Center for Girls Edu Education. Um, um, many of you will recognize um, the woman in the middle uh, who was more of a girl at the time she got famous, Malala Yousafzai. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing her last name correctly. Um, she has uh, taken an interest in in our Safe Spaces program in Northern Nigeria, which we implement uh, in partnership with Center for Girls Education. And she's visited on a few occasions and she even invited some of the girls to accept the Nobel Peace Prize with her in Oslo a few years back. Um, the reason I find the work in Northern Nigeria incredibly um, uplifting is you see a really, we've, we have seen a really rapid transformation in the communities and what they think is appropriate for girls. So um, when, when safe spaces were started in Northern Nigeria um, by our colleagues back in the early 2000s, it was very rare to see an adolescent girl, a teenage girl wearing the school uniform. Um, and families would gossip about the, fam the families that were sending their kids to school, that they were somehow corrupting their girls or putting their girls at risk. And I should, should admit, 
there is a risk to it in northern Nigeria for girls to go to school. I'm sure you've all heard about the attacks and kidnappings. However, on the whole, I think the public health benefits, demographic benefits, and the benefits to the girls themselves are, are still very, um, very positive. And in the communities where safe spaces have been offered, we've seen a super fast transformation. When, when the majority of girls start wearing the, the school uniforms, people's opinions about what's appropriate for, for teenage girls changes really fast. And we saw that the completion rates and the, safe, the girls who were participating in safe spaces increased from four to 82%. And the age of marriage among participating girls increased from 14.9 to 17.4. That's compared with the comparison communities. So I believe that's my last slide, it is. Um, I, oh wait, no, I have one more. Um, I want to, I, I know Population Connection is a nonprofit, so I hope this is not a faux pas, but I will also always promote our own work. Um, we, our website is oasissahel.org. The Fulcrum for the Future piece, which really talks about, analyzes overseas aid for girls education and family planning to the G5 Sahel countries is available at that link. And um, this is my email address and I always welcome feedback and ways to improve our, our talk and um, improve our work. Um, my, excuse me, ways to improve my talk and our work. And uh, also you can join our, we send out about three times a year, a short newsletter. And if you put friends of the Sahel network in the email, we'll add you to that listserv. So uh, thank you again to Population Connection for giving myself and Lucy this chance to share our work and I'll turn it over to Lucy. And happy Earth Day to all. Lucy, when you're ready, if you can share, share your screen. And before Lucy begins, I want to say that she is very brave because English is not her native tongue, but she's, um, this is one of her first presentations in English. She's prepared carefully and I expect you will find it very interesting, but let's be patient with her. Um, go ahead, Lucy, thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, I will go to uh, present my, my part. Uh, thank you for the opportunity you give me to, uh, to, to explain uh, the situation in Burkina Faso. Can you uh, uh, can you uh, put uh, my presentations with... Uh, yes, I can do that. So when you yeah. want me to change the slide, just say next. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. And my, my presentation. Uh... Okay, thank you. And uh, I will go to explain the situation in the Sahel context, sexual and reproductive health, and uh, right and family, plan family planning given uh, the COVID context. context. Thank you. OK, you can go. You can go, Alicia. Two slides, you can go, Alicia. Hello. Alicia, you're muted. It looks like you were just trying to say something. Hello. Lucy, I'm on slide number three. Do you see it from your side? So I'm going yeah. back to the description of the Sahel. Yeah. I finish with first slide. I will go to present uh, two slides. We're still seeing the or I, I should speak for myself. I'm still seeing the first slide. Oh, excuse me. On my screen, it's um, different. So just one minute, please. Bear with us. Thanks. Okay, 
yeah two slide description sorry description we western sahel region in africa lies between the sahara desert in the north and the southern savannah in the south and experience following we have uh, four elements high fertility rate in the world very low contraceptive prevalence maternal mortality estimated at about uh, uh, 20 uh, 25 women per day high mortality rate for every woman who dies approximately 20 other are infant we can result in nearly 5 billion dollars in lost productivity paradoxically this population will double to uh, 40 20 million by 20 uh, 20 in nothing in those yeah you can go the challenge of rapid population growth. The people have a strong ancestry order the land in and its resource. Uh, firstly, strong pleasure on natural resource, gas, water, negative influence on the climate action on, of global warming, with rest of disappearance of certain uh, space or certain regions, resurgation of diseases all as new, Desertification caused by development, mismatches be between resources and populations. You can go. Since uh, 2011, the Wagadu Partnership has helped increase family planning use in West Africa. You can see uh, uh, in uh, 2017, uh, uh, five and 27 million uh, additional users in five years. Can we go? Uh, I will take the case of Burkina population structure. If you take uh, the uh, age pyramid, the Burkina Faso population is very young. With, with 48 person have 15 years old. The result is very high child dependency ratio with weight heavily on the working population and basic social service, education, health, etc. This has important implication for the socio-economic development of the country. Okay. Building resilience in the Sahel in era of forced displacement. In the first GDS bilance, 2 million people had been internally displaced in the Sahel regions. Uh, as of April, uh, April 2021, 20, 1 million Burkina Bay have been displaced. The number e of population is need of assistance in one year has increased by a 60 percent. Uh, you can uh, convert it and 3.5 million billion uh, people. We can go. Order of uh, family planning service, Burkina Faso, state of planning in during COVID. During COVID uh, 28 pandemic, the governor has taken action in the following ways. First, prohibited demonstration involving more than 50 people. Establishment of a cure for quarantine of town affected by this, this disease, compulsory weaving of masks, establishment or of a coordination unit, revision of the response plan, development and orientation need for the continuity of healthcare and health service in the context. Uh, finally, instruction to give this, uh, primary formation sanitary official maintain essential health service in the early hours in health visits. Yeah, you can go. So, evaluation pre COVID reproductive health uh, human resource service. A cross sector sectional quantitative ethnic care out from uh, 20 uh, and uh, 28 October 2020 by British Ingo option of level of 73 health facilities, a give the result. 
The collection covered the month of May, April, May, June, July, and August 2089 and 2020. To objective, main objective, access the capacity of sanitary training to respond not only to COVID, but also to maintain the continuity of reproductive health service. Specific objectives examine the availability of material and human resource resources for the provision of family and abortion, election abortion care, access the use of family planning and elective abortion care and service in the context of COVID, make recommendations for the development of an operational guide for health provider and advocacy plan for maintaining the continuity of essential human resource service. Result, uh, operational capacity index activity. A, in this study, you can give uh, four, five elements. One element, family planning, data management guidelines, guidelines uh, and uh, tools, and tools. You can uh, give, uh, a, obtain uh, a, 62.57, health personnel trained in family planning, 20, minimum equipment for family planning uh, service, 80, 90.7, drives and methods needed for family planning, 67.1, measure taken for, to make family planning accessibility, 28.7, Point three, and you analyze this situation. You can give a forty-nine point six percent to give operational capacity index. Okay, and the situations you can give new user of family planning by age. A the age. Old age is people old age use a frequently family planning service. You can see uh, two to 20 and 24 years. You go frequently in the information center, give, but uh, you give 10 and 30, 40 years, you make little. Uh, Little people go to for massage to training sanitary service to use the service planning uh, service. Go or can you go? Uh, I predict this in the uh, the method contraceptive. I give pills, injectable implant, uh, IUD, mesh and March twenty nine and the March twenty twenty. Uh, the the people young people go uh, uh, go to use uh, little little uh, uh, the planning family service or if you take uh, all the uh, people you go frequently to give a uh, method of contraceptive in the formation uh, the training uh, sanitary service you can go It is the same thing. You can compare this situation in August 29 and August 2020. All uh, people uh, go to uh, training for sanitary service to use uh, uh, the uh, con method contraceptive in planning family. Use uh, the, of safe pregnancy, talent care, and service elective abortion. If you take this situation, 10% of sanitary training surveyed have guidelines and tools for managing elective abortion service. 2.8% have health personnel trained for elective abortion. 6% have the minimum of equipment. 3% all, all, of all drugs needed for abortion care and service. One person have taken steps to ensure healthcare and elective abortion service. You can result 
four person of the sanitary training survey have the necessary operational capacity required to maintain elective abortion care and service in the COVID situation. We can go. Conclusions. The main objective of this study was asked to assess the capacity of uh, 20, 73 health facilities to offer quality care during the pandemic, demonstrated that health care providers do not have the operational capacity necessary to respond to COVID and continuity provide family planning and elective abortion care service. It can result huge underuse of family planning training and elective abortion care service. And finally, urgency to act to maintain the gains made by Wagadu partnership and aim to achieve the goal for each country in 2030, million, uh, 1 million Bukinabe and 6.5 new user of family planning and abortion service for enough, uh, eight, nine government in Wagadu partnership. Thank you. Thanks to both of you very much. This is a lot of really interesting information. Um, I guess we'll get started with participant questions. We did get a couple that were submitted beforehand through the registration form. Um, one of which you, you kind of touched on already, Alicia, but somebody asked, in the Sahel, both education of girls and the availability of voluntary family planning are important of these two, which is the more important to fund. And I just kind of wanted to expand on that a little bit because you know, you talked about the benefits of girls' education, you know, delaying parenthood, basically. And I'm wondering how how much of the reduction in population growth that we find from girls' education is due simply to that, to a delay in childbearing, and how much of it is due to, like, educated women demanding access to contraceptives? Um, or are they still having many children, they're just having them later in life? Um, so, uh, of course, like education in, in terms of the impact of education on fertility, it doesn't work without the access to family planning. So I can be, I am a well-educated person. I have masters in public health, but that alone doesn't allow me to achieve my desired family size. So it's through the fact that I have, you know, information and I have an IUD that I've been able to avoid getting pregnant for the last 10 years. Um, so they so they go hand in hand. The issue is, of course, that um, a lot of these uh, in, in poorer parts of the world, these services are um, often paid for through overseas aid, and education is um, is much more expensive than family planning. Much more expensive, mm -hmm. like ten times more expensive per our recent findings. So um, I think it should start with family planning, but in the end, I mean, there's still a large a desire for large family sizes in the Sahel. And so that will change through education. So I would say that they're both needed, but um, for overseas aid, we should start with making sure that good quality family planning services are in place, um, but also advocate to increase the aid. We found that the gap is about $1.3 billion, which may sound like a lot, or if you're used to big numbers, it won't. Um, in the US spent 700 million on uh, military um, expenses, mostly in Mali. Um, and then Niger and Burkina Faso are having spillover effects. So we spent 700 million in 2020, <clears throat> and we spent about 400 million in 2020 responding to the humanitarian crisis in the same countries. So uh, I think that um, our fair share, um, somebody helped me calculate what the fair share of that 1.3 billion in the needed aid to ensure universal education and family planning is. And that would be about 40% because amongst the donor countries, we have about 40% of the um, gross national income. So that's less than what we're, that 40% of 1.3, I think is about 500 million. It's less than what we're paying mm -hmm. for security and only a little bit more than what we're paying to respond to humanitarian crises in the region. So I'd say it's perfectly affordable. And um, I got the chance to talk to my Congresswoman, Barbara Lee, who chairs the uh, Subcommittee on Foreign Relations at Congress. Uh, excuse me, I didn't get the chance to speak to her. I got the chance to speak to her aide yesterday and we are really making the case for this. So I'll stop there. 
That's great. Well, I think that's a great opener to more discussion about aid, actually, because somebody in the chat asked whether the Gates Foundation funds you. So just ask that question. Um, we, we have we have won a grand challenge. Gates has these um, grand challenges that they award for what they think are good ideas um, for addressing um, challenges in health and uh, and education and such. We did um, get a grant challenge to work with our partner in Niger on an approach to family planning, um, but that's sort of a one-time and very short-term um, funding. I would very much like to get uh, Gates funding in a more um, substantial and longer-term basis. Yeah. One of the questions I had when sorry, I was- Sorry, um, sorry. Yeah. Lucy um, is with Sante Sud, um, which I believe is a French NGO working in Burkina Faso. Lucy, does Sante Sud get funding from the Gates Foundation? Hello? Lucy, tu as compris la question? Est-ce que, est que ton organisation reçoit des fin, un financement de Fondation Gates? Uh, pas pour le moment. Not, not at this time. Mm -mm. Now, one of the things that I noticed when I was looking at the OASIS website is um, there's a lot of discussion of safe abortion, which is something Lucy obviously touched on in her presentation just now, too. And I'm wondering, given the fact that uh, you get USAID funding, how are you able to do work on safe abortion? Vis-a-vis so the Helms Amendment. Yeah, I think the um, the USAID um, logo is on probably on our website. Um, that relates to a, a project that we were part of actually several years ago. So it's a little bit outdated um, called a, a very strange project called Sahel Resilience Learning. But I'm incredibly thankful to that because that allowed us to start our Sahel Leadership Program, which is a program to build a critical mass of leaders across the Francophone Sahel countries. And um, actually, I know Lucy because she was a fellow in that program back in 2017. So fortunately, we don't have that um, restriction now. That makes sense. Actually, safe, safe abortion. I mean, I know it's a, obviously it's a very sensitive topic, but I would say that no country has achieved replacement level fertility without safe abortion. So something to think about. Yeah. Um, stemming from that, has, has Oasis or Sante Sud been affected by the global gag rule when it was implemented under Donald Trump? That's another audience question. Um, we were, we were not because like I said, we've had one time funding from the US government. Again, mm -hmm. I would like to, um, I would like to um, change that. I'm very interested in um, getting um, funding from some of the bilateral donors. Um, um, I don't think, Sante Sud, Lucy, does Sante Sud receive money from the US government? I don't think they would even be eligible. Okay. Um, somebody else wants to know, have you run into the problems of communities not being close to classrooms um, or of language barriers? And if so, how do you deal with those issues? So um, regarding our safe spaces program, we have, I mean, it is, a, a, it's, a, it's one of the most rural parts of the world. Um, uh, I think Niger has, is it about 72% of Niger is still rural, if I'm not mistaken. So and Northern Nigeria is also quite rural, um, although they have a larger population, so it's not as sparsely populated. Um, the Safe Spaces program can be offered in the community, and we've done that in Northern Nigeria, or it can be offered through the schools. And because primary, uh, primary school attendance has increased over years, I think that that's really the better path to scale. So training teachers to also be mentors. And we learned that in Niger, the teachers who were trained in, in, in mentoring, which is a much more <clears throat> participatory, kind of friendly way to teach a class, um, those teachers, the, the school directors really appreciated their participation in as safe space mentors because they saw that their facilitation skills were improved so they were more effective 
classroom teachers, even aside from the, the safe spaces. Hmm. The language is, um, I mean, I'm so proud of Lucy for doing this presentation in English. Language is a barrier um, sometimes between our very small team here in the US and colleagues um, um, in the Sahel, but it's not insurmountable. And uh, for the safe spaces, the best mentors are the mentors who come from the communities. They're the ones that the, the young girls can look up to and see alternative paths in life. And so there's no problem with language there. Yeah, I know that's a really common model for providing family planning services and other reproductive health services as well, like training people in the community who speak the language to actually um, provide healthcare services because they're yeah, just that, obviously a more trusted source. Sorry, Marion. Let me ask um, Lucy because she's a nurse midwife. Uh, Lucy, est-ce qu'il y a des problèmes, des défis uh, liés à, 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 à langage? Uh, entre les prestataires uh, au Burkina et les clients. Oui, partiellement, parce que euh, les, les agents de santé sont affectés sur l'ensemble du territoire. Donc, euh, si on t'envoie dans une zone où tu ne comprends pas la langue, tu es obligé de t'adapter et de passer par les agents de santé à base communautaire pour pouvoir te faire comprendre. Donc, il y a cette difficulté de communication à certains endroits si euh, la personne ou l'agent de santé n'est pas de la localité. Et il y a combien de langues à Burkina? C'est beaucoup plus de 300 <rire> dialectes. Hein? <rire> yeah. beaucoup plus de 300 so, dialectes. Mais les langues essentielles, c'est le Moré, le Fusoubé, le Djula. Et puis, euh, voilà, c'est vraiment les trois. So Lucy says there are three main languages in Burkina Faso, but many, many different dialects. And this is actually a challenge because uh, health, health uh, providers hired by the government are assigned to, to where they're going to work. And so they may not speak the same language. And then they often have to rely on uh, community workers to help um, with the translations so that they can you know, talk, have, discuss with their clients. Mm -hmm. Got some people that are asking about the best way to implement education access. Um, just, you know, we know that family planning is funding, funded through USAID. Is it the same for education programs or what can we do to help improve access to education, especially for girls in the Sahel? Sorry, um, I was also reading the comments at the same time I was trying to listen. Yeah. What, what can we do to improve? Um, Access yeah, well, like what can we in the US do? Um, is there anything specific that we could ask our members of Congress to do um, in order to improve access to girls' education in the Sahel? Um, I think we can, we can give more. And so I think that that would be through talking to your members of Congress. Um, I used to kind of roll my eyes when people would ask me, contact my members of Congress. I'm in one of the most, lib I live in Berkeley. So our <laughs> member of Congress, um, is about as liberal as, you know, and progressive as can get. And um, however, to those of you who are, um, uh, have um, Republican or, um, or members of Congress less inclined to um, value overseas aid, please do talk to them. And actually the Fulcrum for the Future, which I put in the link and I will put, paste the link into the chat in just a moment, um, really discusses where we're at with aid, what US has been giving, um, and, um, and what the gaps are. And it, we tried to summarize what the benefits are of investing in family planning and education. Yeah. Um, all right, um, they're really starting to flow in here. People are sending me questions privately. Um, let's see. Um, well, can you discuss some of the cultural and religious barriers to your work in the region, either of you? Is there pushback um, when you try to you know, convince village elders perhaps why family planning is a service that should be offered or why girls' education is something that everybody would benefit from? Um, Lucy, est-ce que tu as compris la question? C'est une question par rapport à um, pushback ou une un certaine résistance, soit culturelle ou religieuse. Uh, Est-ce que, est que vous et vos collègues, uh, vous avez expérience, uh, vous, vous, vous connaissez une certaine résistance uh, des, 
des personnes euh, en pouvoir, soit au niveau communautaire ou dans le gouvernement pour Kinebe. Oui, euh, il, y a des, il y a des réticences au sein de la communauté. Actuellement, nous conduisons un projet sur la planification familiale au niveau de la région du centre. Dans certaines localités, quand nous partons pour parler de la planification familiale, il nous est interdit de parler de ça au sein de la communauté parce que euh, le, euh, le, 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 le fait qu'il euh, y a la radicalisation religieuse, ça fait qu'on n'a pas le droit de parler de la planification familiale au niveau de certaines localités, déjà au niveau de la région du centre, mais aussi au niveau des zones comme le centre nord, le Sahel et l'Est, où le djihadisme a pris vraiment de l'ampleur dans ces localités-là. Donc, on rencontre des difficultés, notamment au sein de la communauté, au sein des autorités religieuses, mais au niveau du gouvernement, tout est planifié pour nous accompagner à dépasser cela sur le terrain. So, um, Lucy says yes, uh, definitely, especially in the northeast and north center zones of Burkina Faso, um, where there has been a certain um, rad radicalization and jihadism is, is um, I don't know, pre pre present, um, that they, she, she and her colleagues are hearing from uh, both religious leaders and, um, you know, community leaders, other community leaders, that uh, that it's in, it's illegal. It's not allowed to talk about family planning in the community. Um, I would balance that with some success that we've had from the Safe Spaces program, um, including um, I see. Hi, Karen. Karen Pitts is asking about education, about general education and family planning. So the Safe Spaces is actually life school skills, including reproductive health sessions, including family planning, and. Um, general education like numeracy and literacy to supplement what the, because the quality of the regular schools is quite poor generally. Um, so, so that's one distinction and, and family planning services should always include an education component. That's the counseling component of it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, what I want to say is that in the safe spaces program, we have a, um, some, uh, probably one of the, what I've, I've been told she is one of the most respected uh, Islamic female Islamic scholars in northern Nigeria and so at the beginning especially at the beginning of the program we're seeking buy-in from from communities and we still are seeking buy-in from new communities she would sit with the religious and traditional leaders to discuss why this is important to reinforce that the Quran supports literacy for girls and that the that reproductive health and especially knowledge about um, women's bodies is, is is an important part of a girl growing up. And so actually, um, I'm sure she delivers this message much more eloquently than I am here, but she, they have seen great success getting buy-in from, from leaders in, in Northern Nigeria. And we're doing the same model in Niger now also with success. That's really great. I wanna ask a couple of questions about the environmental work that you do before we wrap up. Um, one question from our audience is, the, the Sahel region is facing so many intersect, intersecting and imminent challenges, climate impacts, food insecurity, conflict, corruption, displacement, et cetera. What do you think is the most pressing climate adaptation innovation needed in order to help populations respond to and recover from climate impact? Is this, and if this if that's outside the scope of your work, just say no, so. No, of course. I'm going to say family okay. planning. I'll say family planning. Um, it's you know the intergovernment. It's it's um, for some re not for some reason. I understand why, but it, unfortunately, it's still very sensitive. Uh, it remains sensitive to link family planning and the environment. But the evidence is there, and I'm frustrated. Women Deliver just put out an evidence review, and they said yes, populations related to climate change, but the effects are minimal, or they tried to minimize it. I think that you, I think that that's not what the evidence shows. In fact, I know that's not what the evidence shows. Um, the 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 footprints, the carbon footprints of people in sub-Saharan Africa are incredibly poor. So there's no reason to link family planning with climate mitigation. In any of the poor countries, it's us, the, the high consumers with, with tremendous emissions. That's where you talk about mitigation. Uh, in the US, where nearly one in two pregnancies is unintended, and one out of two of those will go on to a live birth. That's where you can talk about mitigation. In the Sahel region, it's about adaptation. 
And thanks to the, the economic benefits that a family will have at the household level, the health benefits that a woman and children will have if she uses family planning, um, I think that that's one of the best ways for adaptation. I know there are other things that people, um, uh, there are, you know, it's, it's a very, um, the, the people's livelihood depends on uh, farming and raising animals in this part of the world. And so there are plenty of other adaptations I'm familiar with. And if you want some literature on that, you can just email me and I'll, I'll send you what I have. Um, but I'm gonna stick um, with family planning. Lucy, let's give Lucy a chance to, um, um, Lucy, est-ce que, est que tu as des conseils par rapport à la, euh, aux besoins de l'adaptation pour la population sahélienne? Est-ce qu'il y a euh, un ou deux choses que tu voudrais citer par rapport à comment euh, euh, la population sahélienne peut mieux adapter au changement climatique? Je sais que vous, euh, tu es un, une sage femme, alors ce n'est pas, pas ta spécialité, mais si tu veux répondre, nous, nous sommes à l'écoute. Euh, merci. Pour l'adaptation de la population au niveau du Sahel, il faut déjà donner l'information, les éduquer par rapport à la situation et au contexte. Et en fonction de l'éducation qu'ils vont recevoir ou l'information, ils pourront adapter des comportements qui vont les aider à, 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 à tenir compte du contexte, notamment avoir les informations sur la planification familiale, déjà les donner l'information réelle sur l'espacement des naissances et l'espacement des naissances va euh, les amener à pouvoir avoir assez de temps pour euh, travailler et aller au développement. Au-delà de cela, il faut les accompagner dans les cultures, adapter les cultures au contexte au changement climatique afin que les travaux de, 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 de l'agriculture puissent produire des résultats ou euh, un rendement meilleur par rapport au contexte actuel où vraiment la pluviométrie se fait très rare au niveau du Sahel et ce qui empêche aux agriculteurs d'avoir de, des euh, rendements comme il se doit qui va générer des ressources pour pouvoir prendre en charge sur le plan alimentaire la population de la localité. Donc, l'accent vraiment est mis sur la planification familiale, l'éducation et l'adaptation des denrées au contexte ou au, au changement climatique pour que l'un dans l'autre, nous puissions vraiment atteindre des résultats. Voici ce que je pouvais dire. Mm -hmm. um... Uh, Lucy says there are, she agrees with me that family planning is a really important part of adaptation. Um, and uh, I would reference people to the project drawdown. If you look under health and education solutions, you can see that it's one of the com education combined with family planning is one of the top uh, ways to draw down greenhouse gases. Um, she, uh, she also talks about the need to, to improve the counseling for women so that they can better understand how by spacing their children, it will allow them to go back to work, which is an important part of adaptation is being able to, to earn money for the family or contribute to, to um, growing, uh, growing food or raising animals. Um, and and uh, so she talked about family planning, education, and she also said that, you know, this is a part of the world where people are very dependent on rainfall and yet there's not much rainfall. Uh, and so by, um, I don't know if she mentioned irrigation per se, but um, she talked about um, the need for farm, helping farmers to um, make sure that they can grow enough food. And so drip irrigation is actually something very, very proven, very practical and possible. And I've seen it in action. I think Lucy and I even visited a school that had drip irrigation in their, in their schoolyard garden. Um, so, so those are some ways. I'll stop there. One of the things that I've been reading about in preparing for this ne next issue of the magazine, which as I mentioned, is going to kind of focus on the, the Sahel region, um, is the Great Green Wall. Is this something that you're familiar with? And does the work that all of these different agencies are putting into planting, I think it's like 8,000 kilometers of trees stretching across Africa, um, does that work intersect with any of the work that you all do? 
When we started, we were a part of, um, well, when we started as a project of UC Berkeley, the College of Natural Resources was a part of the OASIS initiative, and we are still friendly with that college. Um, I heard a presentation about the Great Green Wall, and what my, one of my ta the takeaways was that it's actually very, it's not just a matter of planting trees in this area, you actually have to plant very deliberately um, in terms of location, otherwise the desired effects won't be, won't be seen. So we're not, we're not working on it, but I'm kind of following it from afar. Yeah, I appreciate, I just put a link in the chat because there is actually quite a bit of information about population growth in the project website, which impressed me because as you mentioned, a lot of places are reticent to talk about um, population growth. And we, we actually saw that same women deliver report that you referenced and were also disappointed um, by the, by the findings um, that they shared. Um, okay, well, we're right at time, I guess. I don't know. I mean, there are a couple of more questions, but I think they kind of overlap questions that you've already answered. So I think we'll probably just try to be uh, judicious with people's time and uh, let everybody go. But we really, really appreciate both of you joining us today. It's just fascinating. Um, it's really great to hear about work that is so related to the work that we do, but um, addressed in such a different way. So thank you, both of you, for, for joining us today.